Hi there. My name's Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. In the last lecture of EC 2026, Introduction to Signal Processing, we talked about how if you add sinusoids and those sinusoids have the same frequency, they combine into a new sinusoid that has the same frequency. If you have a bunch of sinusoids with different frequencies, you can't combine them the same way. All of those frequencies just need to coexist. And that's fine. That makes life more interesting. Suppose you have a signal with n sinusoids, each of them with a particular frequency fk, amplitude ak, and phase phi k. In this lecture, we're going to talk about a graphical way to represent this kind of signal that gives us insight into its behavior. We're going to talk about plots like this. Right now, they may not seem well motivated, but you'll see how they can be useful as we progress through the course. In this particular example, there's what we often call a DC value of 10. So the signal will have a constant of 10 added to everything else. You can think about that as a sinusoid with a frequency of zero. Then it's going to have two real valued sinusoids, one with a frequency of 100 hertz and another with a frequency of 250 hertz. And I want to mention you want to be careful to notice what the units of the horizontal axis are, because sometimes we'll use radians per second. Here we're using hertz. Now, for real valued signals, this kind of two-sided spectrum has conjugate symmetry. So any of the coefficients you see on the left are the complex conjugate of the coefficient you see on the right. So you could leave this out and you wouldn't be losing any information as long as you knew it was a real signal. But having this will give us some insight into a whole bunch of different stuff later in the class. To motivate this kind of diagram, let's recall our inverse Euler formula representations for cosine and sine. If we think about this e to the j omega t, that's a phasor rotating counterclockwise. And if we think about the e to the minus j omega t, that's a phasor rotating clockwise. So when you add those together, the imaginary parts wind up canceling. And if I divide by 2, that gives me my cosine. The DSP First website has this nice movie illustrating this idea. The blue vector corresponds to the e to the j omega t term. And the green dashed line that you see coming out of the origin corresponds to the e to the minus j omega t term. And you could see this offset green vector as you might see in a head to tail diagram in physics. You can see how the imaginary parts cancel out and the real parts add together to give you this red line that's sweeping back and forth. And if we then sweep time along a vertical axis, you can see this red line copy down here and tracing out a cosine wave. This inverse Euler's formula for the cosine is a special case of this general expression for the real part of a complex number in terms of the number plus its complex conjugate divided by two. So let's think of a particular example. Here we have a frequency of seven radians per second. We have a phase of 0.1. That's just 0.1, not 0.1 pi in this example. And we have a somewhat generic amplitude A. We can rewrite this using that inverse Euler's formula as a sum of two complex exponentials, the first representing that vector spinning counterclockwise and the second representing the vector spinning clockwise. Now, according to the way that formula works, I can take the phase, this 0.1, and put it here. But then I put a minus 0.1 here. And also according to the formula, I take that amplitude and divide it by 2. We will represent this kind of equation using a graph. Here, the horizontal axis is in radians per second. That represents our omega. Other graphs might have this in hertz. So each of our lines corresponds to one of these e to the j omega t kind of terms. Here we have a frequency of negative 7. We'll put a little line and we'll write next to the line near the top whatever the coefficient for that e to the j omega t kind of term is. 
So we'll have another one up here for e to the j, 70, and we'll have this coefficient up here. Again, if you're representing a real signal, this graph will always have conjugate symmetry. So if you see a minus something over here, you'll see a plus something over here, and vice versa. And this graph contains all of the parameters of that sinusoid. Now in this class, we generally like to use the cosine form for sinusoids, but sometimes it is convenient just to write sine if that's all you need. The inverse Euler's formula for sine is a little bit more complicated. You have to remember that this minus sign goes with the negative exponent here, and you also have to remember to divide by j. So here, the real parts wind up canceling, and you wind up with this imaginary part that's the sign. So when you divide by j, you just wind up with the sign. Remember that j is equivalent to e to the j pi over 2. So if I have a j in the denominator, that's like having an e to the minus j pi over 2 sitting here. And then when I have a minus sign in front here, well, that minus 1 over j, that's equivalent to j which is equivalent to e to the j pi over 2, which goes here. So this makes the conjugate symmetry clear. So my positive frequency has a phase of minus 0.5 pi, and my negative frequency has a phase of plus 0.5 pi. And you could represent that graphically like this. The moment you see something that looks like e to the j pi over 2 here, you should automatically think, ah, that's a sine wave as in the sin function. Let's think about expanding out a more complicated example in terms of complex exponentials. So I have a minus sign in front, and I can think about that as a phase of pi. So I'll write e to the j pi for the first term and e to the minus j pi for the second term. Now, this might seem a little weird because e to the minus j pi is equivalent to e to the j pi. But writing it like this maintains an apparent conjugate symmetry, and that's just a comforting thing to see. And then from the 1 over j in the sine form, I have this e to the minus j pi over 2 on the positive frequency term, and I have this e to the plus j pi over 2 on the negative frequency term. This 0.1 pi inside the sine expression, well, that would just appear here and here when I expand it out with the appropriate conjugation in the second term. So I have this e to the j 0.1 pi on the first term and e to the minus j 0.1 pi on the second term. And then of course I have my e to the j 7 pi and e to the minus j 7 pi, my counterclockwise and clockwise spinning vectors. In this particular example, these twos all wind up canceling and so all I really need to do is to combine the e to the j phase kind of terms. I'll have e to the j pi and e to the minus j pi over 2. So I have like an e to the j 0.5 pi from that. And when I add in this 0.1 pi, that gives me a 0.6 pi. And then I'll have, of course, a conjugate term, which I can either compute by working out all of this or I just know it's going to be a complex conjugate. So now it's obvious that this expression here is equivalent to 2 cosine 7t plus 0.6 pi. And we can represent this function using this sort of spectrum. And we have e to the j 0.6 pi and e to the minus j 0.6 pi on the left. So this was an example of going from a formula to a spectrum plot. What if we give you a spectrum plot and want you to go back to a formula. So each of these lines represents a term in a summation. The line at zero corresponds to the DC component, and you just write that down. So if I have 10 here, I have 10 here. Oh, and I probably should talk about that term DC. I used that earlier, but didn't really explain it. My use of the term DC is from habit. I'm an electrical engineer, and if you have a constant direct current, that's called DC, but in EE, we'll quite often use that term DC even if there's no current involved, even if you don't have units of amperes and volts or whatever. We just sort of say DC. It's just a habit. Now, for the rest of the terms, 
you'll have an e to the j omega t factor. Here our horizontal axis is in hertz, so I need to multiply by 2 pi in order to convert from hertz to radians per second. And then I take the coefficient that I see written here and just write it in front. And I do that for all the terms. Now I would like to write these in terms of real sinusoids. So to do that I can use Euler's formula and what we do is we just multiply both sides by 2. So I see a 2 here in front on the left and now I can basically match up the terms here with the pairs of terms that you see in this expression above. So basically I read off the frequency component here. I read off the phase from the angle of the complex number in front that's associated with the positive frequency. And then I take this number in front and I double it. And applying that procedure to all of this gives me this expression. So we have this in the general form of a sum of real valued cosines with different frequencies, different amplitudes, and different phases. One thing to be careful about is this constant term. You don't double what you see on the graph for the constant term. So don't turn 10 into 20 in this example. As a review, let's go the other direction. Starting with the formula, you could think about writing these cosines in terms of the real parts of some complex sinusoids. But when thinking about the spectrum, we generally don't use this explicit real part operation. We generally think about writing that real part as these complex conjugate pairs where you have to remember to divide by two. Now in general, if we give you this kind of formula and ask you to draw the spectrum, Unless we tell you otherwise, you don't actually have to go through all of this work here to write these expressions. You just take the DC component, plunk that down there, assuming you have a DC component. It could be zero, in which case you wouldn't have something here. Then you figure out where your lines go based on the frequencies. Be sure to check to see if we're asking for the horizontal axis in hertz or in radians per second. If this was an omega axis, I would need to multiply everything here by 2 pi. And then for the coefficients, you basically go to the right, and whatever phases you see, well, those are your angles in these complex numbers. And then you look at the magnitudes in front, and you divide them by 2. And you plunk them down here, and then you just mirror everything on the right, on the left, with that complex conjugate angle flip. So here's an exam question. Suppose we have the same example we just saw, except for instead of having a DC component of 10, we'll call the DC component capital C. What C would make our function be 0 at time equals 0? So to get that, we can just plug T equals 0 into the function. And if we compute that out, we wind up with C plus 7 equals 0. So C is equal to minus 7. Now let's talk about how we generally write these complex numbers. We usually represent these numbers here in polar form. And if we want to be consistent with that, we would probably write this as 7e to the j pi. But for a real valued signal, you know that the DC value is either a positive real number or a negative real number. So you might write minus 7. There are times where you'll see people use rectangular forms here for the coefficients, particularly when all of your angles are either 0, 90, 180, or minus 90 degrees. People will then write either a positive real number, a negative real number, or a positive imaginary number, or a negative imaginary number. But beyond that, writing these in a rectangular form doesn't really give you a lot of insight. You generally want to write these in a polar form. Notice the lengths of the spectral lines are proportional to the magnitudes, and they all go up. In general, it's the only way to draw things consistently. There are some times when you'll see people drawing lines going down. You generally only see people do that if all of your coefficients are real valued. So you either have a positive number, a negative number, and you don't have anything imaginary going on. So in general, we just have all the lines going up. Now, a word of warning about the future. 
the kind of two-sided spectrum we're plotting here is somewhat stylized and specific to EC2026. In EC3084, we look at the continuous time Fourier transform in all of its glory. And this kind of graph looks like a continuous time Fourier transform in EC3084. But the kinds of graphs we'll draw in 3084 will have little arrows on the end. That's because in 3084, we show you the deeper truth that these are really things called Dirac delta functions. But we don't want to worry about Dirac delta functions now. Those are really scary things that we want to save for later. So don't worry about that now. The other thing is the continuous time Fourier transforms you'll see in 3084. You'll see that we take all of these coefficients and multiply them by 2 pi because of the particular normalization convention we use in 3084. But don't worry about all that until that future course. For right now, go with this. So we have three different ways of representing a sum of real cosines. And I'm considering this constant as a cosine of frequency zero. We can write the cosines as the real part of a complex sinusoid. That's our phasor representation. Or we can write it in terms of these complex conjugate pairs. So those are three different ways of writing the same thing, and they all have their uses. This XK notation was introduced in the lecture on phasors and used in the lecture on phasor addition. In later lectures, we would like to have a more compact way of writing something like this, the phasor divided by 2. We don't want to have to write divided by 2 all the time. We wind up creating this new notation, which uses a lowercase a. And then we wind up writing our sums of complex sinusoids like this, where we let k be negative in order to encapsulate all of the negative frequency terms. This is the kind of notation that we're going to use when we talk about Fourier series in a future lecture. Now, in EC2026, we are generally dealing with real value data, so our spectra have this complex conjugate symmetry. But in some applications like magnetic resonance imaging and radar and radio communications, you'll often pre-process your data and wind up with a form that's well thought of as complex data. So your spectra in those applications may not have this conjugate symmetry.